Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. It is quite late in the day, but I decided that I'm not going to let this day pass before I actually get on here with the Bible dive. Um, you know, today I did read the scriptures ahead of time, uh, the last two, because I thought I was going to come in here today, but I wanted to make sure I do get my reading in. But now I'm going to start with you guys. I'm going to read and go through this as uh, briefly as possible, hopefully, because I honestly <laughs> today didn't feel like coming on. To God be the glory. Anyways, I'm here. So I just, um, yeah. So yesterday we got through to, uh, we finished up with First Timothy chapter 3 and 4. We have 5 and 6 left in First Timothy, which we're going to do today. So that tomorrow we can start with Second Timothy. Actually, tomorrow I may not even be on because I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. But um, after tomorrow. All right. So to God be the glory, y'all. I'm so grateful for the goodness of God this morning. I'm just going to quickly pray. I know I'm kind of, you know, when I get started, I'm always kind of jokey. But, you know, I get serious when starting the word of God, you know. So let's pray. Father, we give our thanks to you. We thank you for your grace, your mercies, your goodness, your faithfulness, Lord, your kindness. Today, I'm just so glad for every good gifts that come from you, Lord. Every good blessings that you've blessed me with, everything that you've ever done in my life, Lord. I'm so grateful. And as we come to read your word today, I'm asking for the understanding in your word, Lord. I'm asking that this word of life will come alive on the pages to us today, Lord God. Father, for we surely need your Holy Spirit alongside us to teach us, O oh God, your word today. And I thank you for everything. As you, we read your word also, Lord, I pray that the life of the word will uh, be ignited in us, Lord, so that we will be made alive through the word. We will be, we'll be washed, O oh God, through the word in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, have your way today, we pray. We give all praise and honor to you, each one that will come into the life today, Lord. I pray that it will be, mighty God, timely, that whatever we speak today through the help of the Holy Spirit, it will be a rhema word, it will be a timely word, something that will bless somebody and encourage somebody today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you guys. So, I am going to start. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. All right, so I'm just going to read quickly. I'm really honestly thinking I'm just going to read through this as much as I can today. and um, But I will see. So it's uh, 1 Timothy chapter First Timothy chapter 5. I feel like I'm too close to my screen. Hold on. Please help me uh, by clicking on your screen, tapping the screen so that we can open up the al algorithm so that people can come in. Help me by sharing the live. Help me by um, your 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 positive comments, hopefully. <laughs> Amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. And so it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5. So last yesterday we ended with the, the, the chapter 4 and verse 16 that says, Take heed unto yourself. So while you're looking at everything else to go on with other people, make sure you check on you. Take heed unto yourself. Make sure you are okay. You are right. You are walking in the light of the Lord. You are walking in faith. You are standing strong in your faith. Take heed, okay? Unto thyself, unto the doctrine. Make sure that you don't, um, the enemy doesn't come in and sow things that is contrary and you accept that and not realize, you know, so be very careful. Take heed unto yourself. Take heed unto the doctrine. Um, continue in them right for in so doing thou shalt save thyself and you may also help others by the way that you live your life will be a living testimony and an example to other people as well so we ended on that note yesterday saying it is um obviously if it's possible that if you don't continue in your faith if you don't walk with the lord as in the beginning you could lose your way and you wonder how is it that you being a believer and a child of god is standing before Jesus and he's saying depart from me I know you're not because he you had let go you did not hold on to your faith you had started doing it in your own ability and in your own strength and flesh and blood beloved ones can never inherit the kingdom of God okay it does mean that this flesh here this piece of flesh that you're looking on will never go to heaven this is it's going to die. It's going to go in the ground and it's going to rot. It also means that flesh and blood, meaning self-effort, will never be able to inherit kingdom. It is the spirit of God. It is what Christ has done on Calvary's cross for you. That is how we will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. And so 
ver chapter 5 says rebuke not an elder right but entreat him as a father He's starting to talk to us about you know yesterday we were talking about uh, different people that are to be put into ministry for example a bishop a deacon and how those who are going to install them or ordain them into ministry ministry should prove them uh check their lifestyle first assure that they are living the life and they are being an example of, of of this office before they get to use the office right but now it's telling you how to treat them once they are in office uh, you know an elder in the church for example he says rebuke not an elder the person is older than you don't be like you know mr. so-and-so brothers you and start rebuking the the person who is older than you there is a respect that you still have to show to your leaders and to your elders right rebuke not an elder but you do have the the, uh, the you do have the the authority to entreat him as a father to come to that person and exhort them as a father and say listen i've seen you doing such and such i don't think that's right and i just wanted to talk to you about it i don't know how you would approach that but you would know based on who you're talking with but you can't go with an attitude of you know you're talking down like i could not rebuke my father my physical father in the flesh like talk to him any and any way right but i could have a reasoning with him to let him know that i think that decision that you're making there is not a good one right but I wouldn't go to him with a bad attitude because he is my father there's a respect level there that has to me be maintained and the same thing goes for the the Christian mighty God on, on the Christian so and so the elder and so it talks about rebuke not an elder but in treat him as a father and the younger men you must also treat them like brethren like brothers the younger men in the church don't t don't treat them any in any way remember that these are your brothers in Christ the elder women you must entreat them as mothers you must deal with them as you're dealing with mo with mothers right the young the elder women and the younger as your sister so that's why sometimes you know you go to church and you hear we say oh sister so-and-so and sister so-and-so and then the older ladies will be like oh mother you know mother so-and-so you know and and the older men we you know we, we we look up to them you know the bible also tells you don't call anybody father and earth but that's not what we're talking about here it's not you going to say like this person is you know those those religious people who look at the leaders and say oh papa 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 because they're giving honor to him as if he's god in their life really you know and god doesn't want you to do that but you can entreat them as you would a father right as you would treat your own father in the flesh right and so honor widows it says that are widows indeed okay so that makes me think is are there some widows that are not necessarily that are not widows indeed right so we're going to look at that we're going to see what does it mean by honoring widows that are widows indeed as we read on further down it i'm sure it's going to explain to us right but if any widow have children or nephews let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents so it's saying about this one that if there is a widow that has children she had children with her her husband before the husband passed away and uh, she have nephews in this passage here is not talking about nephews like your child your 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 um, sister's uh, children or whatever it's talking about your grandchildren so when it says if they have children or nephews it's talking about your your grandchildren so do you have children do you have grandchildren as a widow those grandchildren's duty is to take care of their mother right so it's try what what um what is being said forward here in the scriptures is that even though the church is supposed to take care of these people the onus of taking care of somebody like this is not necessarily gonna supposed to fall automatically on the church because if they have children or grandchildren these children or grandchildren should take their response their responsibility and take care uh, of, uh, of repay really that's what it means by to requite their parents you should repay them for the duty what they have done as parents in your life that's why I believe as a as my as a I've always said I believe that my duty really is to take care of my parents you know when my father needed help and needed me I have to be there no matter how bad or how good he was I have to be there because he's my father so it's my duty to take care of him same thing goes for my mother if ever my mother will need me 
my duty is to make sure that my mother is taken care of right because it's part of the bible it's part of the written word right and so it says in chapter in verse 5 now she that is a widow indeed now we're going to look at who is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in god and continued in supplications and prayers night and day so he's saying that the one that is a true widow a widow indeed she has her husband is gone she has no children she has no grandchildren she ain't got nobody to help her she is truly a widow she now is to um uh, she's like literally considered like desolate her trust now is only in god and she should continue in supplications and prayer night and day but she that lives in pleasure is dead while she's li she's uh, she's living so if you have somebody who is a widow her husband is gone but yet she's out there living it up running around with whoever she feels like that one is not concerned Considered like a widow indeed so the responsibility of this individual does not fall automatically on the church but she so it says and these things give in charge that they may be blameless so you command the church to do these things so that there should not be any blame coming against the church you know some people how oh, come the church collecting so much money and they're not helping out anybody in the church and yet they're not looking at who are the church helping and who's not getting help right so but if any provide not for his own so you have your mom you have your dad your mom and dad is um lost their partner and you are there and you're not taking care of your own if any provide not for his own and especially for those of the household of the of his own house he have denied the faith so the bible says if you're not taking care of the people that is of your own household you're not taking care of the people that is of your own family members, like your mother and your father need your help and you're not there. The scripture says it's because you are denying the faith. You have denied the faith. You're not even considered a believer in Jesus anymore. Because if you truly believe Jesus Christ, you would follow his ways and you will follow the doctrine of, 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 of Jesus Christ and you would actually take care of your own. The Bible says that such a person is worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. Right? So he says you're even worse than the unbeliever. Because you know what? There are unbelievers out there. And they don't believe in God. They're not serving God. But they are, they know already this law is almost like it's written in their hearts. My mom and dad is old. My mom and dad took care of me all their lives. I am going to take care of my mother and my father. And so you do what it is to help out your family. You don't ignore your own mother. And then that's it. You can ignore your mother. And you can take care of everybody else's mother. But yours you ignore. That's something wrong. I don't care if your mother was the worst kind in the world. If you are a believer in Christ, well, what happens to your forgiveness? What happens to your love? Amen. What happened to the grace of God in your life? That you cannot overlook the past and say, you know what? My mother is my mother. I have to be there for her. I have to take care of her. My father is my father. I have to take care of him. Me, I believe in every bit of the Bible, okay? So these, this is something that I didn't even have to read in scriptures. It's just something that I feel in my spirit from ever since. Now I'm reading it and I'm seeing it like that. And I said, okay, well, at least I know my spirit man was already guiding me in the right path, right? Let not a widow be taken to, he says, let not a widow be taken into the number under three square years old, having been the wife of one man. So if, if, um, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man. Um, so the widow, they're trying to describe here who is a widow indeed. Remember we're talking about what is what it means by being a widow and a widow indeed. A widow indeed is, in according to the scriptures, this is the one that is to be counted into the church as the church's responsibility. The one that, is she, this person is over 60, 60 or above. So it's not a young person who can go out and get a job. It's not a young person who might get married again and find themselves somebody. You're 60 and older. You are divorced. You might never even get married again. Okay. It says, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score. Three score means 60. So under 60, you don't count that one in, right? This widow, oh, 60 and older, must be, must having been the wife of one man. So if this person was married and more than one husband, this person doesn't get counted. This person is not considered a widow because your first husband dead, you marry again, you marry again, you marry again. This sec last one died, you're not a widow. 
You understand? He's, the Bible doesn't even consider that because the Bible consider one marriage, huh? the first one, one marriage, right? So let not a widow be taken into into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children. So she's well reported of for good works. N her name is not all around town for evil. Her name is been spoken of for good. She, this woman is a good woman. She's been committed to the Lord. She's been a faithful a wife to her husband. You know, good works, right? If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So this woman is a faithful woman of God, serving God in all area of her life. This one count her in as a widow and put her on the church's payroll. Help her out because her husband is gone and she's over 60. Now she needs your help, right? But the younger widows refuse them. The younger ones, he says, you don't have to put them into the church's payroll. This one can't, um, no, listen carefully to scriptures, guys. The younger widows, because if I, being under 60, my husband passed away, I can go get a job and work. But that's not even the reason why. Listen to the reason why the scripture says that. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton, Younger widows, he says, don't even try to put them on and decide that, oh, we're going to take them up and the church is going to take care of them for the rest of their lives. You know why? Because they're not going to stay like that. They are going to wax wanton. They are going to want to have a man. Wanton against Christ, they will marry. They will go find themselves a husband. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. So these ones are turning away. They, just, they, they might decide to forget about Christ and I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to go get married or whatever. So this one here, you don't have to put them on the, on the payroll. But withdraw, he says, but withal they learn to be idle. And withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also, and busy bodies speaking things which they ought not. These are not the kind of people that God is like, okay, well, make sure you take care of these ones and make sure they get there, you take care of them. Because this is not, these are not representing Christ. You know, God looks out for his own. He really looks out for the people who serve him and serve him in faithfulness, right? I will therefore that the younger women marry. Because you know that there's a possibility for you to start wondering. You have wondering eyes. You're going to see some man. You want to be married. Next thing you know, you're out there doing this, doing that. Get married. Don't allow yourself to get to that point where you're fl flirting. You're throwing your body around. Get married. He says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Right? Some of these younger women who were supposed to be widows, but they were not widows indeed. Their mind was still focused. Widows indeed not thinking of getting married again. This is what it is. The widows indeed who were after their husbands died and they've raised their children, it's them and them alone and they're trusting in God. They are not seeking to get married or to get linked up again. Their minds is on God. They're focusing. They're in prayer and supplication every day. The church is supposed to take care of them. So this was this was what was in uh, set up in the church in the in the day, right? So it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in word and doctrine so these people they are laboring for God they are sir they're dishing out the word every single day they are teaching you know the church and everything they are worthy for the scripture says thou shalt not muzzle the ox that shredded out the corn so you have the ox that's shredding out the corn the ox is working in the field you don't put the muzzle on the ox's mouth so the ox can't eat. That would be, um, you know, maltraitance. They would say in French, you know, you're mal mistreating this, uh, this poor animal. You must let them be able to eat as they're working. So even so, the elders, the workers in the church, they should also be allowed to benefit from, the, from what is coming into the church financially and to be, so we shouldn't walk around and be like, oh, how is it that this pastor, he has this and he has that and they're taking the church money and the church this. The, the, the workman, he says here, 
I believe it says further on that the workman is, is worthy of his labor. But let me keep on doing. He says, it says here, for the scripture said, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So if he works, he should be worthy of his reward. Okay? Ag um, against an elder received not an accusation. So these were points that... that um, uh, that uh, I believe um, Paul felt that he needed to address with the church. Maybe they were having disputes over these things. So Paul was addressing each one of these issues with them. And so he says, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So let's say somebody come to you in the church and they're trying to tell you that, you know, this pastor, he did that and he did that and he did that. You don't need to go and take that as as, as doctrine and say, oh, the pastor did it and now you're carrying it around town. Don't receive such an ac accusation against an elder. It says that against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Make sure that there's another person, another person that can back it up before you take it and swallow it down and start running around talking about the pastor this and the pastor that. You understand? Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. So you're not going to try to, you know, join force with people in their sins. If you know that the person sinned, you can openly. That what you're doing right there is wrong. You need to change. You did that and it is wrong. You can rebuke them openly, right, so that others may fear. He says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So if you're going to rebuke one, rebuke all. You're not going to just be like, if I sin, you will rebuke me openly. But if somebody else who's your buddy, buddy sins, you will be like, mm, I'm not going to say nothing because I don't want to insult my friend. You know, you can't be partial. You have to do it like the same across the board, right? Them that, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. He, then it talks about laying hands. Lay hands suddenly on no man. What does that mean? We were talking yesterday about people electing deacons in the church and, 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 and bishops in the church. And the scripture says that you must prove their office. Let them prove their office first. See that, watch and see that they're living out the lifestyle. Everything that they do is representative of somebody that should be in that office before you actually put them in there. So that's what this would mean, that you don't lay hands suddenly on them. All of a sudden, you know what? I'm going to let Sister Jacqueline become the, uh, you know, the pastor of our church now i want her to be bishop so and so or whatever I, i'm not gonna be a bishop okay so whatever the case may be because that would be laying hands suddenly you're anointing somebody just like that without any background without checking on making sure that they're living holy that they're right you just suddenly put them into the office so it says lay hands suddenly on no man Neither be partaker of other men's sins. So a lot in the in the church, I used to hear people quote this scripture, and they would say that you know the scripture says lay hands suddenly on no man. So they mean like if you're about if a person is praying, gonna pray for you, they shouldn't just come up and lay hands on you and pray for you because you know you don't know what the person have and they might transfer some stuff to you. That's not what the scripture is talking about here. It's talking about ordination, ordering um, ordaining people in ministry. Right? Ordaining people in ministry. So lay hands suddenly on no man. Be, uh, because in that case, he says, be partaker of other, be, be part, neither be partaker of other men's sin. Keep thyself pure. Because if you know that the, if the person is living an ungodly lifestyle and you didn't check out their background before you just decide to make them, uh, put them in office, you are laying hands suddenly on them and then all of a sudden you become a partaker of their sin. Because everybody's going to say, it's Bishop so-and-so who ordained him to be this and Bishop knows that he's living that lifestyle. So all of a sudden you're a partaker. The Bible says, be not partaker in other men's sin. Keep yourself pure. Make sure that yourself is kept pure. Drink no longer. So here Paul was telling them, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake. Now that's not saying that you shouldn't drink water ever again. But Paul is trying to speak to a certain issue in the church. People who might be having at this age, we're talking to an older church where people are becoming widows, there are different things. So at 
at this age, people are having stomach issues, problems with their stomach. He says, don't drink just water. You can take a little wine. Because remember before, a couple of scriptures before, he was telling them that they should not be, um, be uh, what do you call it? They should not um, be, be um, what the scripture says, that you should not be drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the spirit. So Paul was telling them that, you know, don't run after wine where that will make you drunk, but get drunk in the spirit. Be filled with the spirit. But here he's telling them, don't just drink water. Don't drink no more water. Drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. He's not saying go out and become a drunk. He said, take a little wine, but make sure you're doing it. It's for your stomach's sake. It's not just, I'm just out there drinking just for the sake of drinking. I like the taste of alcohol, right? Drink no longer water, but as use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, that thine, that thine often infirmities, um, for, for your often infirmities. So people who are having sickness in the stomach, sometimes a little bit of wine might help with that digestive issue, right? Some men's sins, he says, are open beforehand, meaning that um, it's clear, it's evidence. Some men's sins are open, uh, it's clear, it's evident. You see them, you know they are sin you know that, that they are sinning. You, what they do, as, as you look at it, you can say, any person would tell you, that can't be right. That's wrong. That man should not have been doing that. That person should, as a Christian, should not be living that type of way. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. And some men, they follow after. Some men, it's afterwards you realize that they're sinning and nobody knew it. You understand? So it's not everybody you're going to know exactly that this person is living. Some people have a, a proper outward appearance they know how to cover their sins and to live any and any lifestyle but in secret so you don't know it but there's some that you will know right off the bat right so that's why he says don't lay hands suddenly on any man because you if you don't know that this person is living a secret lifestyle you will not know and you ordain them into ministry and next thing you know you're associated with that because people say oh he must be that because if he puts mr so-and-so in this office knowing you didn't know but you move too quickly without being led by the Holy Spirit. Likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand. Some people are very good. They're doing good works. And you can see it. It's open. You know exactly what they're doing. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. But those people who are doing stuff in secret, good works in secret also, the Bible says it's not going to be hid at some point. You know, it will, God says, do your, your stuff in secret and God is going to reward you openly. Amen? So that was chapter uh, 5. I'm, gonna, I'm going quick because I want to just get through these two chapters for today. So chapter 6 says, let, somebody's been... <laughs> Somebody says... Uh, okay, I have some cultish people following me here talking foolishness. Okay, so I have one person here who's trying to... Keep on, keep on. Amen? So let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Let, okay, so yes, this person was asking me what, what do I have to say about people being servants or slaves or something like that. I think somebody wrote something like this. Oh, we're going to read that. Mm. It's talking about slaves. So he says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Whoever is considered servants under the yoke. I consider myself a servant under the yoke. I have to get up and go to the job every single day. I have days I don't want to go. But the bills have to be paid, right? So I get up and I go and I'm under the yoke of my bosses, right? But my scripture tells me that I must count them with honor. You know, I must honor them anyways. Even I don't like it. Even I don't like being up on the yoke. I must still honor them. Uh, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Right? So people say, how is it that she says she's a Christian and this is her behavior? All the time she's stealing from the, from the company. All the time she's trying to, you know, steal the company's hours. Or, you know, she, 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 she goes home earlier than she's supposed to. She shows up late and pretends she's not, you know. Or she, she puts the wrong hours in because she's trying to get extra pay. Whatever. You know, so you have to have to make sure that your lifestyle is indicative uh, of, a, of a child of God. And so that you don't blaspheme the, the, the grace of God. You don't blaspheme the name of God and the doctrine. Amen. And they that have believing masters. So let's say you're, you're a, a worker. You're under some, you're at your workplace or wherever. 
So I'm using it to the present day because right now, I'm, I, you know, we don't have slavery probably as it used to be. But even those people who just used to have a job, you know, I work for these this family over here. Right. So it says, and they that have believing masters. So they are Christians, your masters. They are believers in Jesus Christ. He says, let them not despise them. It's so easy to despise your master because, oh, well, he's a believer. You know, he has to, he can't treat me the same way that the other unbelieving masters. So I don't have to fear him, you know, so I can do what I want because he's a believer. No, scripture talks about that too. Let them not despise them. Don't despise him because he's a believer because they are brethren your brothers you are serving your own brother therefore but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort so if i'm working for a christian for people who are believers i too must serve them as well as i would serve the unbeliever not because i'm in fear of them but because i i i, I realize i'm it's a brother and, a, and a, a child of god as well so whatever i do for them i do it as unto the lord you know when you serve somebody who's not a christian you might do it because you know you, you know that this person is not a christian and they can have your head you understand so you make sure you do everything but if you know you're serving a child of god don't say oh well because it's a child of god he can't do she he won't do this or that to me because he's a christian so therefore you can treat them any way you want that would not be right as well if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words even the words of our lord jesus christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, and surmisings, right? So, suspicions, uh, right? So, the thing is, if anybody is teaching anything else, you must be very careful not to accept any doctrine that is not the doctrine that's written in this word, because, trust me, they're teaching out of pride, they don't know nothing, what they're talking about, right? Knowing nothing, it's, they're, they're just going on with nonsense, questions and foolishness, right? right? So it says, be careful of those ones. It says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and this destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. You know, a lot of people teach about, you know, finances and, you know, prosperity and how much you should have because you're a child of God scripture says guys because they are teaching this way because they suppose that gain is godliness you know how many people think that it's because of all the, the, what they have um what they have gained as a christian shows how much faith they have how much oh i believe god and you know god bless me while it's the people sending you all their money People who are trying to come out of poverty, people who think, and they're thinking because you're showing all that you got and say the God that you serve gives this to you. And if all you have to do is to bless me, bless me and God will bless you back. But then at the end of the day, you are teaching a false doctrine that gain is godliness. How much you, how much riches you have in this life shows how much faith you have. That's why you got it so. This is, a lot of people are going to have so much to give an account for before God, right? Gain is not godliness. Listen to what this scripture says. It says, from such withdraw thyself. Those people who teach that gain is godliness. Those people who teach the doctrine, um, like the way that they're teaching it causing you know perverse disputings of uh, and, uh, of men of corrupt minds uh, destitute of the truth i mean they don't have no truth in them right and they suppose that gain is godliness turn away from withdraw yourself from those people but godliness it says with contentment is great gain this is a scripture that every person should put in their hearts Every person should memorize this scripture right here. That is 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. 1 Timothy 6, 6. 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. If you can have godliness, you can live a righteous and a holy lifestyle, even though you ain't got nothing to your name, a penny to your name, you have, you have it's like you have all the riches in the world. 
You understand? Godliness with contentment. You are content. You are not trying to do everything that you can to gain more. You are just serving God out of a pure heart. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I've often hear them say, I have never seen, a, 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 what do you call it, a UPS uh, truck following a hearse. You understand? I've never seen, what is it, a, one of those money trucks following a hearse. They've never seen that. You understand? When your hearse is going, your, co your coffin is in it, and that's it. And only the people who are coming to go see you off. Make sure that you are buried in that ground. You understand? But there is, you don't have any of the riches. Nobody can drag their mansion with them. I don't care how big your mansion or how small. Nobody can, can drag with them all their money and all their, their gold and their silver. Even if you put it in your will that you want it to be buried with you. Trust me, people might just read that and then it's not going to happen. Or even if they bury themselves with it, there will be somebody who can go in and dig that up and take it away from you and you cannot do anything about it. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. You can you find something to eat every evening and every morning, be very content. You have something to cover your clothes, your back with, be very content. Sometimes we are so discontent. Oh, we look at the next person, how well they are dressed, and we feel bad that we can't walk, dress that way, so we are going to do everything it takes to make sure. That's why some people steal. That's why people go into stores and shoplift, because of, of, of covetousness. You understand? And they need, want to have this because all my friends are, have this brand name and whatnot and my mom refusing to buy it. My mom is bad. My mom is not bad. Mom is doing everything that she can. But, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And so it says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare to in it, uh, in, uh, sorry, and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So when you are trying so hard to be rich, that desire to be rich is only going to lead you into temptation. That is why you find that people who once start out in the faith in good conscience, start out doing the right thing, and all of a sudden, they switch their message. All of a sudden, they start teaching prosperity doctrine. They start talking about how much God says. You know, I've seen it on video where the, the person says, is trying to say the Holy Spirit, tell him to tell the people to send him how much, how much thousands of dollars. And then at some point, he's, he is, thank you, you all, I see that. <laughs> and then at some point, his mouth slip up and he says, the devil told me to tell you. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That's because the, 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 the Holy Spirit, it's the truth that was coming out. He's trying to say the Holy Spirit tell him and then he says the devil told him because it's really the devil that tells you to tell people that kind of nonsense. You understand? But they that will be rich fall into temptation and sneer into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. When you're seeking after the wealth of this world the bible says you cannot serve god and mammon mammon is money you cannot serve god and money the love of money is the root of all evil it doesn't matter what the evil look like go to the root of it and you will find that it's the love of money that is the very root of this evil why did this person do what they do trace it back and you will find out some money was attached to it. If 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 I if I if I get rid of this person, I will be able to get the the, the um what do you call it there? I will be able to get I, what is wrong with my brain this morning. That's why I didn't want to come on here. But anyways, it's like there's some money attached with it that they're trying to get, right? And so if I if I get rid of them, then I will get the policy, right? I will get the policy, the money. I will get the benefit of, of whatever the policy says, right? Some people can't wait for you to go from this life if you put them in your will. That's why if you put people in your will, you probably can't even tell them these days. It has to be a surprise on the day. Because they will get rid of you just so that they can get that money. The love of money. The roots of all evil. 
All right. And so that's scripture, guys. You know how many times we hear certain statements made and we think it's scripture and people think it's scripture and it's not. But with the one that is actually scripture, people will, will tell you they think it's not. They don't even know it's scripture. This one is scripture. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covets after they have erred from the faith. So when people are coveting after money, they are erring from the faith they're moving away from the faith and perceive themselves and pierce themselves through with many sorrows in, in instead of having happiness when you gain this money the bible says you are piercing yourself through imagine taking a, a sword and pushing it into yourself you're piercing yourself through with many sorrows that's why you have so many rich people money they don't know what to do with it and yet the news, the big news comes out that this one here, unfortunately, we need to let you know that this person has passed. And they pass by their own hands because, you understand? Because they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows running after money. Money does not profit. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. And at the end of the day, it brings you no contentment, but godliness with contentment is great gain but thou O man of god flee these things run away from it not run to run from flee from it and follow after righteousness follow after righteousness godliness faith love patience meekness these are the things that we are supposed to to, to seek to add to our repertoire these are the things that should be points in our resume of life mighty god these are the things that we should add these are the ingredients that we need to add to our daily living that we are seeking righteousness we are seeking godliness we are seeking faith we are seeking love we are seeking patience and we are seeking meekness he says fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life the fight of faith is a good fight there is a good fight and there is a bad fight. You can fight and get in trouble. And you can fight and you win. But there is a good fight and a bad fight. The fight of faith is a good fight to fight. So if you want to be a fighter, get in the boxing match or the ring with faith. Mighty God. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Eternal life is the reward. I watch a lot of boxing and they, they, they fight for the belts, right? So they might want to get the, the, you know, the whichever belt, you know, and so they want to get the belt. Sometimes they have three, four of them hanging off them at the end of the evening because they won all the belts from this champion. They fought the good fight and they finished and they got the belts. So you and I, when we fight the fight of faith, remember my teaching over and over is that works do not save you. It is the faith that you must have in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So God is not calling you to work for salvation. He is saying, I have paid for it, but by faith, you must join in the, faith, the fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of... And why is it a fight? Because trust me, guys, the devil is not going to let you off the hook so easy. When God, when Satan knows that you're a believer, he is going to fight you because he wants to, to, to snatch your faith. Because he knows that if you hold on to faith, you will at the end win that eternal life. So he wants to snatch your faith from you. He wants to strip you of your faith. Amen. And so the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Who are we fighting? Not each other. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We are fighting against spiritual wickedness you know demons that are an assignment to destroy you and to destroy your hope but fight the good fight of faith keep on fighting for the faith earnestly there's a scripture that says we must earnestly contend that's a fighting word right there earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto this unto the saints right so we fight the good fight of faith and we lay hold
grab a hold of eternal life. Mighty God, where unto, uh, where unto thou art also called? You are called to eternal life. You are called from death. You were like that Lazarus that was dead. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Calling him out of death into life again. We were dead in trespasses and sin. Jesus Christ, by his finished work, called us back into life. Transitioned us from death, from death unto life. We are called to eternal life. That is the hope of the righteous. That is the hope of the saints. That is the hope of the believer. Amen. So we are called to right to, to eternal life. And though he says, and has professed a good profession before many witness. Oh, we have confessed this good confession. Confession of our faith. We confess our faith. I believe. I believe. Jesus died for my sins. I believe he resurrected on the third day. I believe that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I have eternal life in him. We confess this good confession of faith, beloved ones. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickens all things, make all things alive, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. In the, in the, in the, when Jesus was being led to Calvary's cross, before Pontius Pilate, he witnessed a good confession. Because when Pilate did his test and his trial of him, he said, I found no fault in this man. A good confession. That is what Jesus Christ, um, up, what, uh, what Pilate, um, Pontius Pilate said about Jesus, I found no fault in this man. Now imagine you and I when we stand before the judgment seat of the Most High God and when he look at us and see us washed and wrapped up in the blood of Jesus Christ, he says I find no fault in this one. Mighty God of Daniel, he will, you will obtain that good confession because you held on to your faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Mighty God, that thou keep this commandment without spots, unrebu unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep this commandment. What is the commandment? Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Grab a hold of eternal life. Keep on keeping on. Hold on, mighty God. Because what? You will be presented unblameable, without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show. The day is going to come, beloved ones, when Jesus Christ himself, in his own timing, he shall show who is the blessed and holy potentate. And right now, everybody have everything to say about Jesus. Everybody can say, oh, he's not God. Oh, Jesus is just a, oh, Jesus is this. But on that day, in his own time, we're going to see who is going to show who is the blessed and only, only potentate. The only one that is all powerful, that has all power. Amen. The King of Kings, that is the King Jesus, amen? And the Lord of Lords, he will publicly declare that. And then every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mighty God of Daniel. So if you believe that beloved child of God, keep the faith, keep on pressing on in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so it says here, who only hath immortality, that is Jesus, he have immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. No man in his own fleshy self can approach unto the light of God. But Jesus Christ is the only one that has immortality and dwells in that light. Whom no man has seen. Nobody has seen God who is called the light. Nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So when Jesus came into the world, he revealed to us God in the flesh. The light God came into the world in flesh and said, I am the light of the world. Amen. And so Jesus revealed him to us. But in terms of he, God in his, um, in his infinite glory, nobody has ever seen him or can see him. 
And so he says, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded. So in essence, Paul is saying there's nothing wrong with being rich. It's okay to be rich. But he said to you, you are rich in this world, be very careful that you are not high-minded. Think, I'm thinking of yourself bigger than you are to think. You're better than everybody. You're bigger than God himself. Amen. You're lifted up in pride because you got some money. He says, think, be careful that you don't think of yourself, that you're not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. See, the riches of this world is, not, is, is uncertain. One minute it is, at this, it is like this, and the next minute it fluctuates. You can be rich tonight, go to bed, wake up poor tomorrow morning because a fire came and destroyed everything that you have. You understand? You can go to bed and you die tomorrow morning. You don't have anything you can carry with you. Somebody can come into your house, rip you off, and you have nothing. All of a sudden, you're crying. You ain't got nothing. So it is uncertain riches, yet people trust in it too much. And our trust is supposed to be in the living God. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Mighty God, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Believers in Christ, your trust must be in the living God, not in your money, not in your wealth, not in your marriage, not in your possessions, not in anything, not even your children, not even in yourself. Your trust must be in the living God. Glory be to God Almighty. I love the word this morning. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So everything that God that we have, and that I never understand. I cannot get it. Because the messages that I hear preached, these are the same scriptures that the people use to tell you, but you need to be rich and you need money and you need to God. Because God give you all things to enjoy, you must get this riches. It's the same scripture that's telling you that you should not trust in this riches. So how are you going to use the scripture? That's why we're going to have a problem in the day of judgment. Because what God gives as a scripture to direct us as to how to live for him we take it and we twist it for our own selfish gain why is it that this scripture is used to preach prosperity why is this scripture i've heard it so many times god has given us all richly all things to enjoy but it's not it's not used to teach us that we should enjoy what god give us but not trust in it it is used to tell you get 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 because god gives you to enjoy you are supposed to have you're supposed to have money 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 cometh money cometh money cometh the devil is a liar i pray that money goeth because money if you fall in love with it more than you love God, it's going to be like you piercing yourself through. Amen. With many sorrows. Mighty God of Daniel. That they do good. So charge them that are rich in this world. That they be not high minded. Nor trust in uncertain riches. But in the living God. That's your trust right there. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Trust him who can give you everything that you need to enjoy. Amen? That they do good. That they be rich in good works. You want to be rich? Be rich in good works. Amen? You want to be rich? Pray that the Lord help you to be rich in good works. Amen? So when your account is looked at, they can see you did this good work over here and that good work over here. My God, this woman is rich in good works. This woman has been blessing people. This woman has been praying for people. This woman has been giving to the church. This woman has been blessing um, you know, people. This woman has been feeding the poor. This woman has been helping people out. Good works. Amen? Not good works to be saved. Now, you're saved, therefore you do good works. That, that's bottom line. We, all, we already cleared that up, right? But you must be rich in good works, not rich in money. And if per adventure you are rich in money, don't make it get to your to your head. Don't be high minded. You know, if the if the scripture I, I have I know they have a Bible, it's a Patwa Bible. Right? If you read it, you probably get it if you understand the Patwa and you can read the Patwa Bible, it will say something like that. No make it get to your head. 
You understand? Don't let it get to your head. Don't become high-minded because you have money. It get it. You understand? Nothing wrong with money, y'all. We all need it, right? The Bible says money answers all things. Money answers all things. You have a doctor bill, money answer that. Your children needs to go to school, money answer that. You're hungry, money answers that, right? You want to go out and have fun, money answers that, right? Money answers all things. You need to get from point A to B, money answers that. But money cannot be your God. It must never become your God. In the mighty name of Jesus, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute. All right. Ready to distribute. Rich in good works. Ready to distribute. You see, most people who have money are not ready to distribute. They will hold on to that money for their life. And they will have it hard to give anybody any of it. Scripture never tell you that. Scripture says grab a hold of eternal life and hold on to that for dear life. You understand? But when it comes to money, people will let go of eternal life and hold on to money. People are not willing to, be, to distribute money. But the Bible says that you must be rich in good works, ready to distribute. Right? Give, share. Willing to communicate. Communicate meaning not speaking with your words. Communicate meaning helping each other, sharing. That's what that means. The same as distributing, giving, and sharing, communicating your blessings to other people. Mighty God. And so laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. When you do good works, right? To help other people. Willing to distribute to the needs of other people. Willing to communicate to the needs of other people. It says you are laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come. Because believe me, there is a time that's going to come. I believe every one of us have a set time to come. And when that time comes and we, the tables are turned and we need help. Our good works will speak for us. Even if you don't have nobody in your life to take care of you, God will provide you somebody. You understand? I take care of people for a living. And sometimes when I see how some people look, they have nobody to visit them, nobody to do whatever. But we are there communicating to their needs, loving them, taking care of them, making them feel like they, 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 you know, they're valued and they, they are loved. You understand? Mighty God. One of the gentlemen looked at me. She, he says to me, does these people around here know how much you do? And I said, I said, you know, I, I know that they know, but it, I don't think anybody cares because I said, I do this. I do it from my heart. Everything I do for you, I do it from my heart. You understand? Because I love these people as if they are my own mommy, daddy, grandparents, what not. You understand but God provide and I always say one of these days if I if I'm blessed enough and I live long enough I may just well be at this place where I'm gonna need somebody to take care of me and I pray that it will come back to me a thousand fold measure pressed down shaken together and running over I don't have any security outside of me just serving the Lord and trusting in him I have no other security. Let me tell you, I, I don't have children. So if I get old, I will have nobody to take care of me. It will have to be God. You understand? It will have to be God. I will have nobody. But I trust in the living God that either he's going to take me out of here before I'm in need or he's going to make sure there's somebody there to take care of me. God is going to work it out. So I have no fear in that because I am laying up treasures. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Amen. When we work like that, we will lay hold of eternal life. Because anyhow you step away from that and you start running after riches, you have turned and swerved from the way of faith. And when you turn out of the way of faith, you are no longer safe.
saved. I don't care how many tongues you speak. I don't care how much rabba shabba you say. I know my booba booba or whatnot. It ain't gonna make no never mind. I don't care. Because if you turn from faith, you are now trusting in your own ability and your own, the, the, the arms of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own in the mighty name of Jesus. And so he says, oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. That you can put your own name. I can put my own name in there. Oh, Jacqueline, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, of, of science falsely so-called. See, a lot of people, even yesterday, somebody come on, oh, I believe in science. Everybody wants to believe everything but the truth, right? I believe in science. Continue. Continue your belief in science. But let me tell you something. Only your faith in Jesus Christ will save you. That's for, that's for sure. You understand? And so, oh, Timothy, oh, Jacqueline, oh, whoever you be, young man, woman, boy, girl, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Mighty God, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace be with thee, amen. So a lot of people profess a whole bunch of nonsense talking about science this and science that. And that's what they want to believe, Scientology and whatnot, whatnot. But they don't want to believe the truth of Jesus Christ. But when they continue in that way, it says they err from the faith. Right? And when you err from the faith, it's like you have turned out of the way. You are going a different direction. There is a, there is a highway called faith that leads to God. A highway call faith that leads to God and if you're not on that highway you have erred you have turned out of the way you are not following your GPS system will tell you recalculate recalculate mighty God and a lot of, lot of us we are not led by the Spirit of God so when the Spirit of God is saying recalculate you are going a different direction than where you're supposed to go recalculate and say turn left turn you still going the wrong direction because you think you know the way anybody who drive know about this right where you've been driving on the gps say go this way and you decide you're going to go on the gps says recalculating recalculating because it's trying to get you and you decide to go some other way you understand now some people might say that analogy doesn't work because, oh, well, sometimes I know a shorter way than the way the GPS is telling me. Well, let me tell you, when it comes to heaven, follow the GPS of faith. Continue on that one. This is the one that's going to lead you there, the voice of faith. Continue on that one. And wherever he leads me, I will go. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory. I hear the song says, where he may lead me. I will go. I think I started too high. For I have learned to trust in so. And I remember twas for me that he was slain on shall lead me night and day Jesus shall lead me all the way something I don't remember the rest of it but that's the song Jesus shall lead me all the way you understand? So the problem with us is that sometimes we stop following. We stop following and we are going our wrong direction. And most of the time is because we're following something else. And most of the time that something else has something to do with money. Because the love of all, the root of all evil. 
Amen. Is the love of money. We want to go our own direction because it's more convenient for us. Mighty God. But God help us that we will follow mighty God the Lord. My desire, guys, is to follow where he may lead me. Sister Sharon, you remember that song, right? Those songs of old that we used to sing. My God. I remember those songs, eh? I love, I love the old time church, eh? I'm telling you, I'm such an old school. I think I was born before my time. I love the old time stuff, right? The old time church where people actually depended on the Holy Spirit. They relied upon the Holy Spirit. They were led by the Holy Spirit. Not this watered down salvation that we see these days. Amen? Everybody have a everybody feel like they know everything that there's there needs to know about God and they don't need to do this thing. The Bible though is irrelevant, right? We don't need all this doctrine from the scriptures. Why should we follow your Bible? You understand? But I would suggest that you get back Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, where I first believed. Oh, glory be to God. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Oh, glory to God. Take me back, dear Lord, where I first believed. I really want to go all the way back. Amen to where I first believe in Jesus. God bless you guys. This is the word for today. I didn't even expect to stay that long. But um, as you know, when you start with the word, you never know what the Holy Spirit is going to speak. And he wants us to know this today. So this is what it is. May, may, may the word of God just um, take root in our hearts. You know, um, when the word is dished out, it's like when you, when you go to a banquet or a buffet, and they have all this stuff that is set up before you. you. You go in and you decide what you want. You take a bit of this and a bit of that. And you eat until you're full. You have people who are picky, choosy in the restaurants or the buffets, right? You know, I don't like that, but I like this and I don't like that. I think with the word of God, it all is good. So you need to take a bit of all of it. You understand take it all as a matter of fact revelations guys there's a part in revelations where a book was given to john a scroll and the and and the angel says take it eat it eat the whole roll the whole roll take the whole thing in your mouth eat all of it you understand he says when you eat it it's going to be sweet in your mouth but when it gets into your belly it's going to be bitter but eat it anyways. Swallow that thing. Because some of us, we only want what we want from the word of God. And any part that's not good, tasty for us, or we don't feel that, uh, we don't want it. You understand? But the whole scroll. Me, that's why I'm going verse by verse, letter by letter, book by book from this Bible. I want to eat the whole thing. I want God to talk to me. And I want to know exactly what it is that he's saying in this Bible. You know, and, and at the end of the day, as I've been saying from before, nobody will have an excuse. If it's not on this platform, it's on another one. You're going to hear about Jesus. Even if you hear them speaking contrary, you can't say nobody has ever mentioned Jesus. Because if you heard Jesus Christ and you don't know, you go search. Read the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life in jesus mighty name but that word there is what is pointing to me jesus that's what jesus said to them okay so god bless you guys and i'm gonna go i'm gonna end here in jesus name father i want to thank you for this awesome word today i ask you to um continue to bless us to continue to lead us to continue to guide us the let the word of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight O lord our god and our redeemer let your word take root in our hearts, Lord. We want more.
more of you every single day, Holy Spirit. Mighty God, we want to feast upon you, Lord. We want to eat the whole scroll. We want to be filled with all the fullness of God. In Jesus' name. Father, if we have sinned any sin, we pray for your forgiveness, Lord. We pray that you will show us the areas that we need to repent. Oh God, and help us, Lord, to make a right about turn. But Lord, let us stay the course. Let us stay in the faith. Let us continue in the faith. Oh God, let us run this race with patience. Mighty God, leaning upon the Lord, trusting only in your word, O oh God. Let us be, O oh God, good servants and stewards of the law of the word of God, and let it become life in us, O oh God, we pray. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for strength every time I sit here, Lord. I thank you, O oh God, my soul worship and magnify your holy name, holy God. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I glorify your name, O oh God. I thank you for every person that comes on and hear a word for today. And I thank you that your word is life, Lord. Mighty God, and where there is any dead thing in our lives, may the word of God fall upon it. And may it be quickened. May we be made alive in you, Lord Jesus. Any area that is sinful, uproot in Jesus name any area that is on un, unholy mighty God till the very soils of our hearts oh God make us righteous before you and holy in your presence oh God let your blood wash over us oh God in the mighty name of Jesus and father if we have turned from the faith in every, any area oh God steer us back oh God take the wheel of our lives oh God steer us back into the right path oh God God, in the mighty name of Jesus, oh mighty God, please Lord, your word has promised Lord, you started a good work in us and you will, you will continue to perform that work, please Holy Ghost, continue with us Lord, because your word oh God can never be, oh God, your, your word are true Lord. Where you said that the Holy Spirit will be with us and will teach us all things and lead us into all truth. So lead us, we pray, as we surrender to you in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you guys for today. Have yourself a wonderful, wonderful day in Jesus' name. Mighty God. Mighty God. God bless you guys.